Good morning. Thank you for the introduction, Cameron. My name is Robert Breedlove. Uh, I am the serve as the Chief Executive and the Chief Investment Officer of Parallax Digital. We are an event-driven hedge fund. Uh, we're focused on investments in the emerging digital economy. So today I'm here to talk to you. Today I'm here to talk to you about uh, the investment universe of Bitcoin and crypto assets. Uh, first, I'd like to share with you my overarching perspective, which I believe that we are each looking at the universe through a keyhole. I can ask anyone in this room if they believe that they understand reality, and every one of you would most likely say that you do. However, as it has been repeatedly proven over the past 30 years, and especially uh, over the past 30 years, that technology reshapes reality for all of us all the time. As Winston Churchill once said, we make our buildings, and our buildings in turn make us. This expression can be expanded to say that the things we make in turn make us. Reality then is a historical process. It is not static. Forty years ago, it was guys like Steve Wozniak playing around with a seemingly useless technology called the personal computer. Twenty-five years ago, it was guys like Jeff Bezos playing around with this weird new thing called the internet. And over the past 10 years, the smartest people I know have been playing around with these new technologies called crypto assets and Bitcoin. So during this presentation, I challenge you to set aside any preconceived notions or conventional wisdom you may hold on to about reality as you see it. We're each looking at the universe through a keyhole, and our best path to understanding reality is to see it through the eyes of one another. This is why we read, converse, and debate with each other all the time, because perspective is everything. And as Schopenhauer said, every man takes the limits of his own field of vision for the limits of the world. So with that, let's dive into the Bitcoin and crypto asset universe in a nutshell. So when we look at the crypto asset universe, there are two distinct hemispheres. On one side, we have Bitcoin. On the other side, we have altcoins, uh, which is basically everything else. Bitcoin is more akin to the internet itself. Uh, this is the internet. It's composed of an open set, a set of open source protocols, uh, some of which you may have heard of, like HTTP or TCP IP. Um, and in the same way the internet is a set of open source protocols for moving information, Bitcoin is a set of open source protocols for moving value. Hence, Bitcoin's other nickname, common nickname, is the Internet of Value. So, Bitcoin can actually be thought of as the latest layer in the Internet Protocol suite. And I believe it will grow to touch everything and everyone that the Internet touches today. So, this Internet-centric perspective also gives us a useful analogy when thinking about how one could stop Bitcoin. The analogous question being, how does one turn off the entire Internet everywhere permanently? When we look at Bitcoin as money, it continues to evolve on the free market and it is competing against literally monopoly money. What I mean by this is that money today is monopolized by central banks and Bitcoin is disintermediating that market. On the other side of the crypto asset universe, we have altcoins. What are altcoins? Altcoins have basically adopted the open source technology underpinning Bitcoin to attempt to do one of three things. To either compete with it directly as money, to disintermediate other market spaces, or to enable entirely new market spaces, such as decentralized finance, predictions markets, distributed computing power, etc. So far, the use cases for altcoins are mostly unproven, and Bitcoin is positioned to capture the vast majority of the value created during this wave of innovation. Altcoins are essentially venture capital investments that can be launched at low cost and are subjected to little, if any, professional due diligence. Hence their other nickname, shitcoins. This is why it's very important to be extremely cautious when investing in altcoins. It smells like a bad deal, it probably is. Shifting back to Bitcoin, to truly understand its impact, we must first understand the nature of money itself. The first thing to understand is that money, like everything else, evolves over time. Throughout history, many different monetary technologies have been used, including seashells, salt, cattle, precious metals, and most recently, government paper. Monetary technologies are always in competition with one another and undergo a market-driven natural selection process, which gives rise to new forms of money and causes older forms to fade into extinction. 
Monetary evolution is a market-driven selection process. It's somewhat similar to the evolutionary process we see in telecommunications technologies. In telecommunications, no matter what technology is used to accomplish it, its purpose remains the same, to communicate information across space and time. However, the telecommunications technologies we use also change or evolve over time. We've gone from cave paintings to carrier pigeons to newspapers. Sorry. Cave paintings, carrier pigeons, newspapers, telegraphs, telephones, and to the digital media that is predominant today. As newer te telecommunications technologies are invented that provide higher messaging speed, fidelity, fidelity, reliability, traceability, or mobility, they become the dominant means of communicating information across space and time. Similar to the purpose of telecommunications, the purpose of money also remains the same, to communicate value across space and time. Like telecommunications, the monetary technologies we use to communicate value have also changed over time. We've gone from commodities to precious metals, to metal coinage, to the government paper that is predominant today. As newer monetary technologies are invented that provide greater hardness, divisibility, portability, durability, or recognizability, they become the dominant method of communicating value across space and time. Of these five monetary traits, the primary one which determines which technology succeeds or fails on the free market is called hardness, on which we will now focus. So the hardness of money is the difficulty necessary to produce an incremental unit of the monetary instrument. For example, the energy expenditure necessary to mine an ounce of gold, or the keystroke necessary to produce a new US dollar. Monetary hardness is quantified by the stock to flow ratio. Stock is the existing supply of money, flow is the newly created supply over a year, and the higher the stock to flow, the harder the money. Each time an additional monetary unit is created, whether it's a newly mined ounce of gold or a freshly printed US dollar, the other units in the money supply become less scarce and lose purchasing power. This effect is commonly called inflation, which is actually just the inverse of the stock to flow ratio. The term inflation is a euphemism. It is actually the dilution of monetary value in an insidious form of taxation without representation. Inflation can be easily understood with a simple baseball card analogy. If I own one of 100 Babe Ruth rookie baseball cards in the world, every time someone discovers the 101st, mine becomes less rare and therefore less valuable. The same is true with money. Each time a new unit is created, all the other units are diluted in value. So in a free market, people naturally and rationally choose to store their wealth in the monetary technology with a supply that is hardest to inflate. Whether it's mining gold, printing dollars, counterfeiting dollars, whatever it may be. So in this sense, gold is the king of hard money. And this is why it became dominant in the, in the world, because its supply is most resistant to inflation. Again, its monetary hardness is defined by the stock to flow ratio. Gold is virtually indestructible, meaning that virtually every ounce mined throughout history remains part of its existing supply today. It's costly and expensive to mine it out of the ground, so it has a reliably low flow. And taken in combination, these two characteristics give gold it's the highest stock to flow ratio of any monetary metal. So, if gold is so great, why are we all using government paper today? Well, gold has one major drawback, and that is that it's not easily divisible. This makes it difficult to use as a medium of exchange. For instance, buying uh, coffee with gold coins is not very convenient. Gold's divisibility problem is what gave silver some marginal utility as a medium of exchange throughout history, whereas gold was typically reserved for settling large bank transactions. Eventually, central banks stepped in and solved gold's divisibility problem by issuing banknotes that were fully redeemable in gold. As we all know, banknotes are light and easy to transact with, making them much more convenient to use than physical gold. This caused the centralization of gold within bank vaults, like you see here. And over time, this became too tempting for central banks to resist stealing from. As banks created more banknotes than they could support with their gold reserves, they started revoking banknote redeemability for gold 
thus implementing the money backed by the anticipated future cash flows of the taxman, fiat currencies. Here, we see a note from Zimbabwe valued at $100 trillion. And this is the first case, but certainly not the last, that a central bank made a class of impoverished trillionaires. <laughs> Now, for a quick history of fiat currencies in the U.S., in 1933, Executive Order 6102 required all U.S. citizens to forfeit all gold holdings to the government under the threat of up to 10 years imprisonment. This confiscatory action was simply a means of consolidating government power and defending the value of an ever-softening U.S. dollar after its World War I spending spree. Later, during World War II, the U.S. became a geographic safe haven for the gold hordes of many European countries that were vulnerable to invasion and plundering by Nazi Germany. This transfer of physical gold into Fort Knox would later position the U.S. to rewrite the rules of the global financial system. At the conclusion of World War II, the U.S. organized the now infamous Bretton Woods Conference, where it established itself as the global central bank in which all international currencies would be pegged to the dollar, which in turn would be pegged to gold. Many years and many, many dollars printed later in 1971, U.S. President Nixon unilaterally canceled the redeemability of U.S. dollars for gold and promised that the U.S. would eventually return to a gold standard, which of course never happened, thus ushering the world into the age of fiat currencies. So today, the world is dominated by a government fiat currency, which is backed by its ability to tax citizens and is, in fact, the softest form of money that has ever existed, as the cost to produce an additional unit of fiat currency is near zero. Of course, fiat currency value has reflected this softness. Here we see the U.S. dollar, which is one of the world's strongest fiat currencies, has lost about 97% of its purchasing power in the past century. Now, jumping into the 21st century. In the wake of the 2008 Great Recession, when central banks all over the world were busy printing more fiat currency to reflate their broken economies, Satoshi Nakamoto, an anonymous programmer, released an open source software project into the world. He, she, or they called it Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the hardest form of money that has ever existed. This momentous innovation is made possible by an ever-rising production difficulty that requires energy expenditure in a process called proof-of-work, also called Bitcoin mining. This energy expenditure is the key to Bitcoin's supreme monetary hardness. Bitcoin's stock-to-flow ratio increases inevitably every four years and will surpass that of gold within the next 18 months. This will be the first time in history we've had a money harder than gold. Bitcoin's hardness is enforced by unbreakable cryptography, making its monetary hardness as reliable as 1 plus 1 equals 2. <coughs> Bitcoin also has perfect, it's the first, world's first asset with perfect supply and elasticity, as changes in its price have absolutely no impact on its new supply flow. This means that increases in demand for Bitcoin can only be expressed in its market price. Contrast this with gold. If the price of gold increases, its new supply flow will increase as well, as new miners enter the market, since gold now fetches a higher price. New miners means more new supply flow of gold, which decreases gold's stock-to-flow ratio, and therefore its value is money. With Bitcoin, no matter how much its price increases, it is absolutely impossible to create any new supply flow beyond its mathematically enforced and universally transparent supply flow schedule. Bitcoin's money supply is fixed. Only 21 million units will ever exist. This means that its stock-to-flow ratio will continue to increase every four years and eventually become infinite when the last Bitcoin is produced sometime in the middle of the 22nd century. For this reason, Bitcoin's money supply is becoming the most trusted in the world as it is fully transparent and unchangeable. This runs countervailing to government monetary policy which is opaque, uncertain, and subject to the change at the whim of banking bureaucrats. 
So in this way, the invention of Bitcoin has led us to a discovery, the discovery of absolute scarcity. Before Bitcoin, only time itself was absolutely scarce. Money as a technology is the means by which we market price and exchange our time with one another. Bitcoin perfectly mirrors this quintessential substance of life and economics, time. In the same way that Galileo's invention of the telescope led to discoveries that forever changed mankind's relationship with space, so too does Satoshi's invention of Bitcoin, by leading us to the discovery of absolute scarcity, forever change our relationship with time and its market-based symbol, money. So, I believe owning Bitcoin is smart. Bitcoin is the fastest growing asset in human history. Bitcoin has a flawless track record of, a brief track record of about 11 years. Uh, Bitcoin is also uncorrelated to traditional capital markets, making it an ideal instrument for portfolio diversification and optimization. For instance, a portfolio of 1% Bitcoin and 99% cash outperformed the S&P 500 over the past decade. Also, central banks all over the world are printing money at an unprecedented pace, creating an environment where all value flows to scarce assets, like real estate, gold, and the world's only absolutely scarce asset, Bitcoin. And if we zoom out, we will see that hard money, as chosen on the free market, has reigned for the first 4,900 out of 5,000 years of human commercial history. And I believe we are witnessing its reemergence and the rise of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the most credible money supply in human history, disrupting the most untrustworthy money supplies in human history, namely those managed by central banks all across the world. A bet on Bitcoin is that the competitive dynamics inherent to the market for money will continue to play out as they always have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Robert. I really do appreciate that.